Father, thank you so much for this afternoon in this beautiful church, Father. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us, the joy and the happiness of our families, Father, the food that you provide, the jobs that we have, Father. But also, Father, thank you for the challenges that are brought before us because they make us stronger, Father. They draw us closer to you, Father, and bless us through those challenges, Father, as we go through this week and uh, make progress in advancing your kingdom here on earth. We love you, Father. We pray for these things. Father, bless the words that I have today. Let it be a, a blessing for those that hear them, Father, and uh, let it equip those that may need to be equipped in terms of the word. We love you and praise you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I don't see a clock. Is your clock not on? So I have all the time in the world. Relax, people. Get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. I'm going to share a little bit about my background, but first and foremost, uh, the message I draw from is from the book of Joshua. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible, the first chapter. It's essentially a message on leadership. You don't have to look it up now. I just want you to share with you because I think the concept of the book of Joshua applies to all of us in whatever role and capacity that we're in. We're leaders, whether we're leader of a church or whether we're leaders in our home or at work or within our families, we are leaders. And it's scary to be a leader. And it's scary when God calls you to lead. And I just want to share with you that it's important to have strength and courage. The, the, uh, God mentions it to Joshua three times in that passage from verse 1 to 9. And he doesn't mention it as a recommendation, but as a commandment. And that commandment is for you as well. That you're called to be strong and courageous in what you do. But you're also the call to be faithful and obedient in everything that you do. And he promises Joshua that he'll be successful wherever he sets his foot. And that message goes to you. If you are faithful and obedient, strong and courageous, you'll be successful wherever you set your foot. But you can't deviate. You can't go to the right when you should be going straight. You can't be going to the left when you should be going straight. You need to be going straight one foot after the other. Now, courage is a strange word, and I'll define it very quickly for you. Courage isn't not being afraid. Courage is moving forward despite your fears. Does that make sense? Making progress, advancing the kingdom, putting one foot in front of the other and going forward. That's what courage is, no matter what's around you. Amen? I'm going to give you a little bit about my background. I did my undergraduate studies at UC Irvine. I actually was a pre-med major. I wanted to be a medical doctor because they make a lot of money. Make more money than pastors. <laughs> And I was ready to go. I was ready to be a medical doctor. And someone said, why don't you volunteer at a hospital first? It'll help your application, it'll look good. So I volunteered at the hospital. They put me on the OBGYN ward. And if you don't know what that is, that's where the babies are born. And I love babies, I said, sure, I'll do it. And I went through about 20 of these deliveries. But all it took was that first one to change my mind. I got a call, back in the day they gave us pagers, but big olive garden sized pagers, you know, so you wouldn't steal them that said St. Joseph's Hospital on them. And I had my pager, it rang at two in the morning and I ran to the hospital, it ran out of my apartment, shouting to my roommates, I'm off to save the world and deliver my first baby. Got to the hospital and everything changed like that. It was technical and blue sheets and heart pressure monitors, blood pressure monitors, nurses coming in and out, and it was serious. There's no joking. And that was a 16 hour first delivery. 16 hours of screaming, of crying, a little bit of fainting, some vomiting. And all of it was coming from me. <laughs> she was fine. I was like, yeah, no puedo, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> I learned two things that day. First of all, that medicine's a beautiful profession, but it isn't for everybody. And it wasn't for me. The second thing I learned was, you ever hear that saying that childbirth is the most beautiful thing in the world? Liars. <laughs> Liars. If it's your baby, it is, right? But if it's somebody else's, it's like Alien 3. <laughs> so I chose psychology. I have a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology from Washington State University. I did my internship at UCLA Medical Center, and I did something called a postdoc at Cornell University in New York. And from there, I went to Washington, D.C., uh, where I was called to lead an organization in terms of fellowships. I wrote about $20 million worth of grants. 
I was doing great in that job. I was 27 years old, you know, young PhD. I had it made. I took the train in every day from Virginia to Washington, D.C. And I remember one morning I took the train, it was snowing, it was beautiful. And I was reflecting and contemplating and speaking to God. And I said to God, God, I've, I've made it. I'm Dr. Marty. I got new shoes. I got a new briefcase. I got a corner office in Washington, D.C. It didn't have a window, but it was a corner office. I made it, Lord. And then he spoke to me. I graduated from all these colleges. And he spoke to me. And he simply said, what have you done for me, Marty? And that's all it took. And I got frustrated. I was like, Lord, why are you asking me now? Why are you waiting until I've accumulated $300,000 in student loan debt? Why, why are you calling me now? You're not calling me now, are you? And I got frustrated. I didn't go to Bible college. I have a PhD in clinical psychology. And I prayed. And I caution you about this prayer. But I said this prayer, and I prayed it over and over again for several months. And I caution you because if you say this prayer, God will respond. And the prayer was simply, Lord, use me. Use me, Lord. I don't know how you're going to use me. I don't know what you're going to do with this education or grant writing or accreditation background, but use me. And he said, okay, go to California. And so I said, all right. He said, quit your job and go to California. So I applied for three positions first. And, I, and one of them was as dean at the medical school at UC Irvine. It was a great position. And uh, it, they gave you a house on the campus at UC Irvine. Beautiful, and a big salary. The second was as a psychologist at Kaiser Permanente Hospital. Have you heard of Kaiser? They had great benefits and it paid well. And the third job was a lowly assistant professorship position, like the most lowest assistant professorship. It's assistant professor, and then it's like, well, below that. There ain't much. And that one hardly paid. In fact, if I, if I took that job, I'd have to live with my in-laws for a year because I couldn't afford an apartment with my family. And I love my in-laws, just not that much. <laughs> I applied. In two weeks, I got all three offers. Praise the Lord. So I went to try to convince God that he needs to send me to the medical school because the medical school students need Jesus. And I told him that, oh, Lord, medical students need Jesus. Lord, send me there. I'll bring those medical students to you. We'll partner with this Lord. And he said, no, you're going to that small little Vanguard school. You're going to that little school that doesn't pay anything. And I was sad. And I came back to him the next day because I think, God, you must be confused. <laughs> I, I, maybe I didn't explain myself well. And well, maybe he didn't understand me, right? Because I said, Lord, send me, send me to Kaiser and I'll, I'll bring you the patience, Lord. Send me to Kaiser. They got good benefits. Send me to Kaiser, Lord. Come on. And he said, no, nope, you're going to that Vanguard little school. And that's what we did. Because you got to be faithful and obedient when you're working with God. You can't ask God to use you and then choose how he wants to use you. And so I did. And we stayed there. And he blessed us tremendously. I stayed there for 10 years. Uh, we ended up buying a house within a year and moved up to be a vice president, went to be another vice president, another Assemblies of God school, ended up at a medical school where I was making the most money I'd ever made in the world and in my life, and then uh, was promoted three times in two years to be a senior vice president. And in the moment, I was praying again, thinking, I want to go back to Christian higher education. Lord, send me to Christian higher education. And I waited, and I got interviews. I got calls. I didn't even have to apply. I just, people were headhunters would call you. And I got a call from Biola, from APU, from Vanguard, from Fuller. Cal Baptist even called me, but nothing happened. And this little school, LABI College, started to call me and I ignored their calls. And they're a tiny little, we're a small school. You know, financially we're always hurting. Uh, you know, need to have accreditation, had shut down at one point. And the head of the college called me and said, finally tracked me down on Facebook and said, we need you at LABI College. And what, what was I gonna do? So I interviewed, I said, Lord, and I said, Lord, you don't want me to go here. Lord, I'm a psychologist, I have a PhD, I'm an ordained minister, but 
A Bible college? Lord, you don't want me to go there. I interviewed and they made me an offer. And then we had to meet to discuss the offer. And, uh, and uh, you know, because you got to talk about, you know, what, it, what is involved. And I, and I said, well, Dr. John, that was the head of the department, head of the uh, board, he said, I said, Dr. Can you talk to me about the benefits? Oh, he said, oh, there's no benefits. I said, none? He goes, no, nah, yeah, none. There's no benefits. And, and what about the contract? Because pastors get, you know, doc, uh, presidents get contracts for five years, security, job security. And I said, well, tell me about the contract. Oh, there's no contract. Oh, we, we can fire you tomorrow. We, we'll let you go. And I started to think. And I, and I, it was hard, but we got to ask about the money, right? How do you do this awkward thing? You know, I'm a very, how do you ask somebody about how much you're going to get paid? So I started with, you know, my wife will probably want to know, not for me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to serve the Lord and, you know, you pay me peanuts and I'll work for the peanuts. I love peanuts. But my wife, she likes to shop, you know, buy stuff and pay the mortgage and stuff like that. And, ha, how much does it pay? You know, how much does it, and he laughed and he said, oh, about a third of what you're making now. And when he said that, I felt even in the moment I'm accepting this job because this is coming from the Lord. We have to be strong and courageous. We have to be faithful and obedient. If we're truly living our life through Christ, this is, for me, this was an opportunity to be faithful to God. I didn't care about the job. I didn't worry about the job. I didn't worry about a paycheck. I, it was an opportunity to be faithful to God. So I accepted it. I've been there five years. In the five years, we've have now the highest level of accreditation. We are the only Bible college that's state approved in the state of California. We're not exempt, we are approved. They looked at our curriculum, they looked at our faculty, they looked at our, our campus and said, you're approved. And we're now eligible, we're eligible for financial aid and the whole night, we've never been eligible for financial aid. So God is good. And now I see why God put me here. And I've written grants, even though we're hurting for funds always, I've written almost $2 million worth of grants to this unaccredited Bible school that had never received a, a grant before like that. We've got nearly two million. We still need more funds. We need your prayer and blessings, but we've, we've got there. Now I understand. God is good. Amen. Fears and phobias. Who's afraid of something? Somebody raise your hand if you're afraid of something. Josh, what are you afraid of today, this morning? Rats. Big, scary rats. Not little rats. It's got to be like a gangster rat that he's afraid of. A thug rat. All right. Hood rat. All right, I'm afraid of. My wife taught me about those concepts. I'm not sure that's the same thing, but who else has a fear? Flying cockroaches. Not the strolling or walking or running cockroaches, but the ones that fly. I, I'm afraid of all those things. Who else? Who's a, Bats. Very rare, but still, they're there. They can do stuff. Uh, I'm afraid to keep asking you guys. Snakes, okay, very, all of these are pretty common. All right, who's afraid of heights? No, you're not. You're afraid of falling. <laughs> it's that thing that's afraid of, but you know what? Those things do not make a disorder. A phobia, which most of us have of something, is not a disorder unless it interferes with your life. And I wanna define that for you. I want you to first of all embrace the fact that you're weird. Every single one of you. I'm not bad, you're just weird. You, oh, I'm normal, no you're not. I can see it in your face. But you know, that's what's beautiful about how God created us. We're not cookie cutters. There is no true normalcy. Uh, we're different, we're peculiar. Some of you are afraid of heights and falling and snakes and spiders and whatever, you know. But that's not a disorder. That's just what makes us different and beautiful in my eyes. What the disorder is, is does it affect your functioning in your life? Does it affect your school, your work, your family, your social, and the most important one of all is, is it affecting your spiritual walk? As a psychologist who works with pastors and others, I ask first and foremost, how's your spiritual walk? Because if that is off, everything else is messed up. Uh, you don't know this, but I also work exclusively with pastors. I provide counseling, mental health and emotional counseling to pastors. That's my ministry. I don't charge them a, a thing. But we need to bless our pastors. We need to support our pastors. We need to stop attacking our pastors. We need to start loving upon our pastors. We need to lift them up and encourage them because pastors oftentimes suffer the greatest, some of them, not all of them, depression, the greatest anxiety, the greatest stresses. And oftentimes they don't have an outlet to go to. 
and I feel blessed and honored that they come to me. If we bless, equip, and invest in our pastors, we are blessing, equipping, and investing in the church. So we've got to take care of our pastors. I work with uh, Doug Clay, who's the general council superintendent of all the Assemblies of God, our fellowship. Doug Clay invited me personally to be part of a committee to work on mental health and pastoral uh, issues. So that's why I want to talk about that with you as well. Your fears and phobias are not a disorder, unless it's interfering with your functioning. Then it can become a disorder, amen? Okay, let's look at some images of the brain. We gotta go this kind of back side of the brain actually affects your vision. You see it really back here, not here. It's connected to the back. Uh, right side and left side of the temporal lobe is more the auditory cortex, hearing. Parietal lobe, which is right here, is more sensation and feeling. And the last part to develop of your brain is the frontal lobe. Now, before I say that, when do you think your brain fully develops? At what age? Five? 25. 28. 21. 25 is the number. 25. Now, why is that important? It's important. Do the next slide. We'll go through this kind of quickly. Next slide. We'll go to, we'll go, this is alcohol. It's your brain on alcohol. Your brain doesn't fully develop at 25. That's when this part of the brain, the frontal lobe, makes executive decisions. So this is the one that helps you make good decisions. A lot of you are older, 25, older than 25. Think about when you were 15. What kind of decisions did you make? Not good? That's because you were brain damaged. Your brain was not fully developed at 15. When people do bad stuff, behaviorally, or do drugs or alcohol, when do they start, before or after 25? Before, because the brain's not fully developed. You know, and that's real important. If we could protect our members of our church from not doing drugs, show them these images. You can Google them and you can find them. But you can see an alcoholic brain. I'm gonna show you a, a, an opioid-dependent brain in a moment that looks like a schizophrenic brain, that looks like a crystal meth brain. I'll show that in a moment. Protect the brain. You look at Dr. Harris, what do you think? Did I ever do drugs? Why do you gotta laugh? <laughs> Last time, somebody in Spanish said, no, Dr. Tu nunca usas this, you never use drugs. I'm like, amen, sister. You don't know me, but that's, I, I appreciate that. But, but this third service just laughs at you. <laughs> Please, he's, he's probably on something right now. I never did drugs. And it wasn't because of some pompous, I'm better or whatever. It just drugs cost money and I was poor. <laughs> that was, a, poverty actually can be a protective factor. It really, it can be. You look at the research and, well, you're really poor. You, somebody offered me a cigarette when I was 12 years old. And I was like, well, how much is that? This was in the 70s. And I was like, they were like, oh, 75 cents a pack. I was like, whoa, that's the cost of a Big Mac. <laughs> I'm hungry. No, thank you. Enjoy your cigarette. And two years later, somebody offered me a little marijuana cigarette, you know, a little joint, I think they called them. And I knew what it was, right? Because that was after football practice. Hey, Marty, why don't you try, take a hit off of this joint. I was like, okay. Uh, and my big, big Mac calculator came on in my head. How much is that? And they said about 10 bucks a gram. And I was like, whoa, that's 10 Big Macs. <laughs> and then I hear that makes you hungry. Man, I ain't got no food. I will die if I start smoking marijuana. Starvation. Obviously, I didn't stop, starve, but never did drugs. But we got to protect our brain. If you can protect a child's brain or a young adult's brain till after 25, the chances are they'll never use drugs and they'll never use alcohol. But show them what your brain will do. If you affect your brain, and you can affect it through drugs, alcohol, depression, or anxiety, if your brain is compromised, then you're not complete. You can't fully worship. You can't fully love. You can't fully forgive. And you're kind of not fully yourself. And that's why mental health is important to take care of yourself so that you are the most complete person you can be to worship, to forgive, to love. Amen? Let's look at another image. We'll skip that one. That one. And that's an opioid dependent brain. Think of all the painkillers that people are taking that's in the news. That's what that brain looks like. Now, 
just so you know, that's, that's the f holes in the functionality of the brain. So if you look at the brain, it's still whole, but in those areas where there are holes, no sugar is being metabolized, no oxygen is getting there, no blood's getting there. So it's dying. That also looks like a schizophrenic brain, and it also looks like a crystal meth brain. So somebody who's on crystal is, does that. We've got to take care of our brains. What are some couple things you can do? So to help with your stress, Pastor Josh. You mentioned this at the 8 o'clock. Can somebody who's using, if they stop? Absolutely. So no matter what you're taking, you stop doing drugs for a year, your brain's going to repair itself. Now, it may not get there perfectly, but stop for a year. And that's what we usually look at the data. If you look at this website, you can look it up and you can see a brain on crystal meth and a brain after a year of being clean, it'll repair itself, okay? So there's, there's hope for that. Three things you can do to help you with your mood and your stress. First of all, you gotta give up the notion that you can control other people. You can't control their thoughts. You can't control somebody else's feelings or actions. And this is, I'm talking about relationships and most people are here in a relationship. I get calls all the time, I get young people, 16, 17 year old, they've been dating for three months and this is the whole world to them. And he keeps calling me at three o'clock in the morning for four hours, we're fighting and fighting and fighting. He did that all last week. And I said, tonta? <laughs> Silly, throw your phone away. As nobody's calling me at three o'clock in the morning, I don't care. You know, I don't care, nobody fighting with, no, you allow things to happen. So you can't, you can't control somebody else and they can't control you. And, and you've heard the term in Spanish maybe, or in English, it's manipulator. Oh, she's such a manipulator. Es manipuladora. And I say, bull, you allow yourself to be manipulated. You've got to draw your boundaries and begin to control your thoughts and your feelings and your actions. I don't care who it is, if it's your son, daughter, husband, wife, friend, if you're letting yourself manipulate, that's on you, okay? So you can't do that. Depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, addictions, those are actually all brain problems. It depends on the area of the brain. They're medical conditions. They're not just psychological. All diagnoses that are mental disorders come from a medical diagnostic book. So we have to be open to medical treatments. That doesn't mean we always have to get a, a drug or a pill, no. In fact, there's things that you can do, church, where you don't have to take meds. Cardiovascular exercise has the same potency as antidepressant medication for mild to moderate depression. So just exercise regularly can help your brain be strong. And I deal with pastors all the time. I've got 80-year-old pastors that come and see me, 60-year-old pastors come and see me, and I say, no, you probably need to get on an antidepressant. Well, what else can I do, pastor, Dr. Harris? And I say, well, you can go get some exercise. I'll do that. And they try that for two weeks and they come back and say, what's the name of that pill? <laughs> some people are good with medication, some people aren't. Exercise is one thing you can do. We as believers have within our tool bag things that non-believers do not have, that are powerful and more effective than any medication on the market for anxiety and depression, but it only works if we practice it. What are some things? We have hope and the non-believer has coincidence circumstance. It just, it is what it is. We have hope. We have meaning. We have purpose. We have God's promises for your life. And if you walk around with your head looking down, you're not reflecting God's promises. You got to walk with your head up even during the difficult times. Let me say even more when it's difficult times, because you're not just living your life. You're a walking testimony to everybody who's around you. And they're saying, well, she's a Christian, but look at her. Or he's a Christian and look at him. He's just complaining and moping all day long. You've got to walk with your head high, understanding that God's promises will be fulfilled for your life. It, 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 there's no questions about that. You have love and the greatest example of love. You know, the father's love, the sacrifice of the son and love of family. You have love. And we as a culture and cultures, we're a very diverse community here. We have love within our, which is a powerful love. Uh, I call my children my Prozac pills from heaven. I can have a really bad day and I get them from time to time as a struggling president at a small college. And all it takes is a, is a, is a, is I surround my office with pictures of my children and I'm reminded of God's love and his promises for me. Boom, and I'm elevated. Love, here's a couple of things. 
I work with pastors for the most part. We need to get rid of our pride. If we would just humble ourselves, that'll make a big world. It changes your brain chemistry when you're humble. And forgiveness is powerful. If you walk around with bitterness in your heart and unforgiveness, and a lot of people here are due, I can see it in your face. I'm analyzing you right now. I'm building my practice, just looking at some of your faces. If you're walking around with bitterness and, and resentment and unforgiveness, and I've heard everything in 30 years of, of work. So you can't, well, you don't know what he did. You know, yeah, maybe I don't, but I've heard it all. But if you're walking around with unforgiveness in your heart, this is real important. You are stealing, you're stealing, you're robbing. What do you mean? You're stealing from your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend, your husband or your wife, because that bitterness in your heart is taking away from who you could, what could you could offer them. You're not complete. You're stealing from your children because of that bitterness and lack of sleep and irritability. You can't give them the love that they need. You're stealing from yourself because you're wasting time thinking about that situation. You're losing sleep. People, you're letting people take up rent in your house and they're not even paying rent. Raise the rent, kick them out. Take that love that, you, that you're wasting because of bitterness and give that to your family. You're stealing from God. Because I believe, and I think you'll agree with me, that you can't completely worship him if your heart is split with bitterness and unforgiveness. You gotta forgive, and we have that, and we know that, amen? Time's up, but I just wanna do a special prayer of blessing for those that may be struggling with depression, anxiety, stress, family issue, or know somebody that needs prayer over that. And I'm gonna ask you to just raise your hand. You're not gonna come up here, it'll be a very quick prayer. I just wanna look around and let God come to you where you're seated to see if we can help with that. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this brief conversation and sharing of your love, of forgiveness, of hope, of meaning, of purpose, of being strong and courageous, Father. I ask, Father, that you give these people the strength and courage to go forward. That you equip them, Father, with the courage to move despite the fears that may surround them. And that you lift them up and show them your love. You show them the purpose for their life. You, get, you, you reflect the promises that you have for their lives, Father. And that you protect them, Father, in everything that they're doing, Father. That you bless each step as they go forward and reach and cross the Jordan River to the promised land of the promises that you have for them, for their families, for their church and the community. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.